Hello, and welcome to this satellite titled Men and HIV Insights from Sub-Saharan Africa. On behalf of the guest editors of the supplement in the Journal of the International AIDS Society, we would like to welcome you to this session. My name is Tanya Shuchek from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and together with my co-chair, Dr. James Ayeko from the Kenya Medical Research Institute, we are really glad that you've joined us. Today's session marks the official launch of a special issue in the journal of the AIDS, uh, of the International AIDS Society that was published at the end of June with the same title. We hope that you'll access the supplement online. You can also download it directly from your conference briefcase. Today, James and I are joined by four special guests who will be part of our discussion at the end of the session. They are Wole Amenya, Technical Officer in the HIV, Hepatitis, and STI Department at the WHO in Geneva, who is also a guest editor on the supplement. Katie Godfrey, a Senior Technical Advisor with PETFAR, joining us from Washington, DC. Nelson Adwoma, the Executive Director of the National Empowerment Network of People, living with HIV and AIDS in Kenya, joining us from Nairobi. And Harsha Thuramurthy, an Associate Professor and Associate Director of the Center for Health, Incentives and Behavioral Economics at the University of Pennsylvania in the US, who is also an author from the supplement. So please go ahead and throughout the session, enter your questions in the chat for our panelists. The chat can be found at the right top hand corner of your screen. The session today will feature a series of pre-recorded presentations where the other guest editors, Wole Amenya and Anna Grimsrud provide a brief intro and wrap up. And in between, you'll hear from five of the papers in the special issue. After hearing from the authors, we are going to discuss with the panelists on how we do better in engaging men in HIV services and in health in general. So please enjoy the pre-recorded content and we invite you to start chatting with us throughout using the chat function, which is the top right-hand corner, sharing your comments and questions. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining in. My name is Wale Amean, and I work with the World Health Organization's HIV, Hepatitis, and STI programs. Now, there is no gain saying that the men gap along the HIV cascade is quite stark, and there is the need for evidence and insights on engaging men living with HIV. It is why I have the absolute delight to introduce and uh, present an overview of the GIAS supplement, Men and HIV Insights from Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's been quite the journey. I have to say this has been a very time consuming, but fulfilling process as well. After the call for submissions, we had well over 100 abstracts that were submitted from which we can deduce two things. First, there seems to now be an appetite for this work. And then secondly, there is quite a lot that we can begin to draw from countries on how to enhance uptake for integrated HIV services for men. I'd like to thank my fellow guest editors, Tanya, James, and Anna, for putting such efforts into um, a rewarding process. That process has led to this supplement, the beautiful cover of which you can see to the left of my screen. Uh, and this cover has been deliberately designed to give a feel of what you expect, or what you expect from, from the supplement. The graphic shows uh, the need to include that men thinking in the drive towards the 95-95 targets, but also, and this is important, reaching men where they are, how they want, and in their diversity. Now, despite the large number of abstracts, we found many of them limited on evidence uh, and data uh, on what exactly works. But after a very long process, we've been able to um, narrow down to 11 articles, eight of them full-length research articles, two viewpoints, and an editor. Now, after my introduction, you will have the pleasure of listening to presentations on five of those 11 articles. What I will do now is to run through some key themes on papers that were not included in the presentations. The first is this fascinating analysis by Catherine Double and colleagues who paints the vivid picture of how health systems are structurally gendered in a way that omits men in Malawi. The point here is that this omission from national guidelines and, and strategic plans has a trickle down effect in the way uh, that uh, men engage services. 
Also in this supplement is a viewpoint from Lesotho, Stenda and Rosario have done a fantastic job in presenting the Kotla experience of engaging men, not just for HIV, but for other health services as well. A key takeaway from this viewpoint, and I invite you to please have a read, is the need for differentiated services for men and the impact of having male-friendly health workers, male-friendly hours, male-friendly spaces with ultimate aim of uh, providing male-friendly services. You will see in this supplement a very interesting article from Anne Gotet and colleagues on creating risk profiles for, for men in South Africa. They use the latent class approach using data from cross-sectional studies to identify four distinct HIV risk profiles among men in, uh, in Durban, South Africa, which raises the question, are we really reaching the right men of the right age and profile? I think that will be an interesting one to, to see as we go ahead. What we see as well is that men are behind in the first 95. And this is an article from Shapiro and colleagues on oral and blood-based testing and linkage for men in Pazunu Natal, South Africa. What is clear is that we need to be more creative and strategic uh, in testing men uh, and in trying to know their status as we, as we go ahead. Finally, I come back to my earlier point on the need to engage men in their diversity. This article from Bhattacharya and colleagues analyzes ways to engage men who have sex with men for HIV testing and treatment through virtual spaces and speaks to how such um, spaces could be, could be leveraged. In my final slide, I introduce you to the rest of the program, which will see five other engaging presentations from articles in the supplement. We will then have a wrap up by my fellow guest editor, Anna Grimsrud, and then we'll continue with the rest of the program with moderated discussions. So please sit back and enjoy the program. And I hope that these discussions instigate the much needed global engagement to improve health outcomes for men. Thank you. My name is Tawanda Makusha. Firstly, I would like to thank the International AIDS Society for giving me the opportunity to present our work on reframing the approach to heterosexual men in the HIV epidemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. I would like to thank and acknowledge two of my co-authors, Heidi Van Royen and Mona Connell. Next slide, please. Across Sub-Saharan Africa, compared with women, heterosexual men are less likely to be tested for HIV, less likely to initiate antiretroviral therapy, older and sicker when they do start treatment, and they have a higher mortality in HIV care. This has been documented for many years. But despite this evidence, men's health is still being ignored. And men are implicitly blamed for infecting women because of their poor health-seeking behaviors and often described as vectors or transmitters of HIV. Next slide, please. Why is this important in terms of health? Because this framing allows us to neglect men in our HIV responses. So that 30 years into the epidemic, we still have almost no HIV interventions or research for heterosexual men. This framing is also important because it refers to women, children, key populations as vulnerable, while men and women are treated as competing populations. And when men are included in interventions or research, it is framed as improving women's health. We believe that neither women nor men benefit from this approach and that men, like women, have the right to health for their own sake. Next slide, please. So this raises the question, who is vulnerable? We recognize that a range of biological and structural factors impact on the health of women. So too for men. And this include the gendered nature of the health systems which prioritizes women, as well as the different risk factors men are exposed to across the life course. Yet for men, this complex range of factors is reduced to choices an individual man makes. And then men are implicitly blamed for not accessing care and for, not having, and for having poor outcomes in care. Next slide, please.
But there is evidence that men do care about their health. We conducted a study in Peri Eben, KwaZulu Natal, between 2015 and 2019 to increase the linkages uh, into care for men. This is an area with extremely high levels of poverty, unemployment, alcohol consumption, alongside high prevalence rates, high HIV prevalence rates. Our study has some unexpected findings. Men were surprisingly willing to test for HIV among 6,988 men. 97% were willing to test for HIV. Notably, most men reported that they felt blamed for the epidemic and unsupported when they accessed healthcare services. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? So we know that men do care about their health. How then do we change the framing to include men? We acknowledge that there has been some progress in this area recently. We are noticing international health agencies and donor fund, uh, funders starting to focus, some, uh, focus more on men. Some countries have formulated national strategic plans on men and HIV. There has been a growing body of research on men and HIV, as well as men and health more broadly. And more importantly, the landmark International AIDS Society Forum in Mexico last year which was the first day-long seminar focusing on men and HIV at an international AIDS conference. Now we really need to build on this momentum. Next slide, please. In conclusion, we urgently need to reframe the approach to men in the HIV epidemic. We need to watch our language. No more portraying men as the, as the problem. The different vulnerabilities of men and women need to be acknowledged and addressed. Interventions for men and women should be complementary and not competing. In getting the frame right, we have a chance to address the biggest gap in our response to HIV. I thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ruan Barnabas, and I am an Associate Professor of Global Health and Medicine at the University of Washington. It is my privilege today to present the results from a randomized pilot study of lottery incentives among men living with HIV in South Africa on behalf of my colleagues listed on this slide. Among people living with HIV in South Africa, viral suppression is lower among men, 45%, than women, 65%. And this has direct implications for HIV-associated morbidity, mortality, and onward transmission. Condition, conditional lottery incentives, which reward behavior with a chance to win a prize, are hypothesized to motivate present-day engagement in HIV care for future health gain. We tested whether conditional lottery incentives would increase engagement in care at each step of the HIV continuum of care, clinic registration, art initiation, and viral suppression. 132 participants were enrolled in the study. We used focus groups to determine the appropriate lottery incentive, and this was decided by the group as being either a mobile phone, data, or a gift card, valued at a thousand rand or about a hundred dollars. At each step, lottery group participants were notified that they had been entered into the lottery and then two days later, they found out whether or not they had won. Men living with HIV who were not on ART were identified through community and facility-based testing. They were randomized to either an optimized ART linkage package, including SMS support, or an optimized ART linkage package, including SMS support, plus a lottery. At each stage of the continuum, when they registered at the clinic, initiated ART, or came back for refills and assessment of viral suppression, 
they received a message saying that they had been entered into a, lo a lottery and then found out whether or not they had won. Overall, for the 132 participants, 77% were over the age of 30, 72% were unemployed, and surprisingly, more than half were virally suppressed at baseline. At study exit, 83% of participants visited a clinic, 62% of participants were virally suppressed, and lottery incentives decreased the median time to ART initiation from 126 to 66 days. And this was statistically significant among all participants and from 134 days to just 20 days among participants who were not virally suppressed. Lottery incentives had a small but non-significant effect on clinical registration, increasing clinic registration by 22% and viral suppression by 13% overall, but neither of these results were statistically significant. Lottery incentives increased viral suppression by 35% for participants with detectable viral load at baseline, but this was also not statistically significant due to the small sample size. But overall, for participants who, were, who had a detectable viral load at baseline, uh, lottery incentives increased clinic registration, ART initiation, and viral suppression. The probability of ART initiation was higher among participants in the incentive group, and this was a statistically significant impact. Lottery incentives had a short-term impact on decreasing the time to ART initiation. Through this, we can see that lottery incentives can impact short-term behavior, but would need some additional adaptation to achieve goals over the long term, including viral suppression for life. For life. This has direct implications for future policy and research. Conditional lottery incentives shortened the time to AIT initiation by an average of 60 days among South African men with a trend towards increased viral suppression. Short-term behavioral economic strategies can decrease time to AIT initiation but requires strengthening or adaptation to engage men in care to achieve and sustain viral suppression. The uptake of lottery incentives will require buy-in from stakeholders, including providers and clients. If lottery incentives successfully increase viral suppression, the gains in health may outweigh the nominal cost. Using a lottery system is attractive economically because although the individual prize might be large, the number of prizes are limited, and so this could be an economically sustainable intervention. I want to thank the study participants, our funders, and the study team for all their excellent work, especially my co-principal investigator on this study, Dr. Heidi van Royen. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to receive questions by email. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Cassidy Clausen from the University of Maryland, and I'll be presenting to you on community testing and targeted approaches to finding men in Zambia. As we know, traditional approaches to HIV testing in Sub-Saharan Africa has focused on women and children and generally failed to provide adequate services to men. In Zambia, there's a generalized HIV prevalence of over 11%, and up to a quarter of adult men do not know their HIV status. Traditional appro approaches to finding men have included community-based HIV testing, which has shown yields of 6 to 11%, and index testing, which has shown overall pos positive yields of from 10 to upwards of 50%. So using these approaches, we designed the, community, the circuits project, which uses community approaches to find key and priority populations, including men in Zambia. So we use primarily index testing and targeted community testing approaches. In, in index testing, we identified eligible index clients in the facility and traced them in the community. They were offered index testing services and contacts were elicited. Uh, all contacts were screened for potential harm, such as GBV, and if eligible, they were then traced in the community. Uh, those who were known to be HIV positive were linked back to ART, and all, all other index contacts were offered HIV testing. 
Those who were found to be HIV negative were, were linked to combination HIV prevention services. And those who were found to be HIV positive were linked to ART back at the facility and then themselves offered index testing services. We also provided targeted community testing approaches for men. After training our staff on male specific approaches, we conducted targeted uh, testing at formal and informal workplaces. This included uh, security companies, bottling companies, breweries, utility companies, as well as informal places like marketplaces and taxi ranks and bus stands. We also made sure to sensitize the community leaders in each of these places to understand the importance of HIV testing and knowing one's status. To assess our program, we conducted a retrospective analysis of programmatic aggregate data over the first year of the project and performed descriptive statistics for the positivity yield and ART linkage. So overall, circuits tested in its first year over 38,000 people and found almost 11,000 people living with HIV for an overall positivity yield of 29%, of whom 93% were linked to ART. Index testing was had a very high positivity yield, 45%, but suboptimal ART linkage at 89%. Targeted community testing found 22% positivity yield with really the same absolute numbers, but a much higher overall linkage. Among men specifically, we tested 18,000 men and found 4,500 for an overall yield of 24% with linkage of 93%. Index testing found among 5,500 uh, people tested via index testing, we found 2,200 positives for a positive yield of 40%, but again, suboptimal linkage at 88%. Targeted community testing resulted in similar absolute numbers of 2,200, but an overall, lower overall yield at 18% but higher ART linkage. Breaking this down, the index testing cascade among men, we've, we offered index testing services to 5,600 clients of whom 5,000 accepted. And from those clients, we elicited 10,000 men. We traced three quarters of those men in the community of whom almost 2,000 were known positives and 5,500 did not know their status. Of that 5,500, we found 2,200 positives for a positive yield of 40%, of whom 88% were linked to ART. So in Zambia, index testing was found to be highly effective in identifying men living with HIV with a positivity yield of 40%, but ART linkage was suboptimal at 88%. We found that targeted community testing, particularly at workplaces and other places where men gather, resulted in a lower yield, but similar absolute numbers and a higher linkage to ART at 97%. We postulated that perhaps the reason for this difference in linkage is that people found via index testing are not actively seeking healthcare services at the time and thus may be less motivated. In addition, people found via community testing, those places had often had a healthcare worker on site who was willing to initiate same day ART thus reducing barriers to ART initiation. So implications for future work, HIV testing for finding men, we found that HIV, the index testing and targeted community testing are highly effective strategies to find men living with HIV and link them to ART. So these, these community-based approaches need to be paired with facility-based approaches because community-based approaches are are very effective but tend to be more labor intensive and more costly than traditional facility-based approach, approaches which are lower yield but also um, less labor intensive. So pairing the two together will be needed to close the gap to the first 95 for men. With that, I'd like to close and say thank you to the Circuits Project, the MOH, our collaborating partner, and our funder, PEPFAR and CDC as well as our collaborating partner, Ciders, and of course, all of the healthcare worker staff, uh, the University of Maryland staff that are pictured here, at the MOH healthcare workers, our community health workers, and of course, our clients. Thank you so much for your time. Hello, I'm Sue Naparella from RTI International. I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to present our research on male partner testing and sexual behavior following provision of multiple HIV self-test kits to Kenyan women at higher risk of HIV infection in a cluster randomized trial. As we highlight through this satellite session, it's imperative to increase the engagement of men in HIV services. 
Without their increased engagement in both prevention and care services, achievement of global HIV goals, including the UNAIDS 95-95-95 goals may be compromised. Increasing uptake of HIV testing by men is the critical first step towards prevention services, early diagnosis of HIV infection, and reducing HIV transmission. The privacy, convenience, and autonomy that oral fluid-based HIV self-testing provides has the potential to overcome many of the barriers to HIV testing cited by men. Secondary distribution of self-tests by women to their male partners is a promising approach that's been employed in a number of countries for increasing male testing and may also convey prevention benefits to women. In this research, we examine male partner and couples testing outcomes and sexual decision-making associated with this secondary distribution approach in the context of a large cluster randomized trial called the Jakinge study. We collected data from women in the 33 intervention clusters of our randomized trial in Saea County, Kenya. Women were recruited from fishing communities and transactional sex hotspots such as bars and hotels. To be eligible, women had to be HIV negative, at least 18 years of age, and to have self-reported two or more sexual partners in the past month. The intervention included providing participants with oral fluid-based HIV, HIV self-tests at enrollment and at three monthly intervals or as needed. And participants were then encouraged to distribute the test to their sexual partners when they anticipated having sex without a condom. At six month follow-up, we collected data on self-test distribution, male partner and couples testing, and sexual behavior <clears throat> in the three most recent transactional sex encounters. Of the 1,057 women enrolled in the intervention clusters, 87% completed the six month follow-up visit. Average age was 28 years, 65% were married, and 72% reported at least some income through sex work. Participants received a total of 7,283 self-tests over the six-month period, which was a median of eight tests per participant. Participants offered a median of three self-test kits to sexual partners. This figure shows the utilization of all 7,283 self-test kits. Just under half were distributed to sexual partners, 39% were used by participants themselves, and 3% were distributed to other individuals. 12% of test kits went unused. Among participants who reported having a primary partner, 94% offered the partner a self-test. Of these, 97% accepted the test, and when accepted, couples testing was reported among 91% of participants. So the figure on the right shows these same partner and couples testing data, but with the denominator being all participants with a primary partner. These numbers equate to 90% of primary partners learning their HIV status, and 83% of participants testing as a couple with their primary partner. Among the 1,954 transactional sex encounters that we recorded, 64% included an offer to self-test. Of these, 93% accepted the test, and when accepted, couples testing was reported among 84% of participants. This slide presents data on condom use among the three most recent transactional sex partners. Compared to transactional sex partners who were offered an HIV self-test kit and tested negative, condom use was significantly higher when men were offered a self-test kit and had a reactive result, when men refused the self-test, and when men were not offered a self-test. Providing women with multiple self-tests facilitated male partner and couples testing and led to safer sexual behavior. Future analyses from this ongoing research will look at follow-up over an average of 24 months per participant and will compare outcomes by study arm. However, we've seen from this research that higher risk women were willing and capable of offering self-tests to both their primary and transactional sex partners with encouraging results. Operationalizing secondary distribution of self-tests could be an important way to ensure that men have higher access to HIV testing 
and could also increase couples testing and promotion of risk-reducing behaviors. How to best operationalize secondary distribution to reach men most in need of testing will be an important consideration. Future, further research is required to evaluate male partner access to post-test services, which we didn't explore in this research, and what type of programming can best support men's linkage to these services. I thank you uh, for your attention, and thanks to my co-authors and the many collaborators on this research. Hello, my name is Meg Osler, and I work at the University of Cape Town as a Senior Technical Advisor for Strategic Information. And today I'm going to present on the population-wide gender differentials in HIV service access and outcomes in the Western Cape, South Africa, between 2008 and 2018. Next. So patient cohorts and randomized trials have demonstrated reduced access to care and increased mortality in men accessing ART, but there are limited real world data from high HIV burden countries exploring the HIV care and treatment cascade, spanning all people living with HIV and accessing care in the public sector across a large region. In addition, there are a few studies that have looked at tuberculosis and pregnancy impacting male and female HIV access and outcomes across a large region. Next. This study uh, explores HIV care and antiretroviral therapy access, as well as mortality outcomes across the Western Cape, South Africa, and its impact of changing treatment guidelines on differential outcomes with a specific focus on men. Um, it contain, the study contains all people with a CD4 count between 2008 and 2017, and assessment data is included up to 2018. It's, the data is a linked patient record um, with sources um, that include the health information system data, lab results from the National Health Laboratory Services, and all deaths from the vital registry. We've used Cox proportional hazard models for all people with a South African ID, and the analysis is restricted to three years after first presentation. And we have categorized um, the analyses based on eligibility period. Next. Although HIV prevalence is lower, men are presenting much later than women with more advanced disease. 67% of men estimated as having HIV in 2015 attended services in 2015, while 77% of women with HIV attended. Of those with the first ever CD4 count, 37% were for men, which is similar to the prevalence figures, but 49% of those with HIV advanced disease, defined as a CD4 less than 100, were for men. Pregnancy and TB increased access to ART. Next. And next. In the Western Cape public sector, on average throughout the study, 33% of adults attending HIV care were men. Um, however, as previously mentioned, 49% of those with the CD4 count in indicating advanced HIV disease were from men, and 58% of the TB co-infection cases were in men. So um, during survival analysis using Cox proportional hazards and using non-pregnant women as the reference, Males were 21% less likely to start ART, and pregnant females were 17% more likely to start ART. Next. Again, when comparing using non-pregnant females as the reference, males were 13% more likely to die, and pregnant females were 44% less likely to die. Next. Women have benefited overall more from the scale up of HIV and ART services. Pregnant women are 38% 30, more likely to start ART compared to men. Non-pregnant women are 21% more likely to start ART compared to men. And men were 13% more likely to die than non-pregnant women. Men were 57% more likely to die than pregnant women. And we have seen that the majority of TB is in men which increases mortality by 55%. Next. 
So in conclusion, although prevalence is lower, men present to HIV care with uh, more advanced disease, have poor attendance rates, and at, are at an increased risk of death. TB co-infection is um, in men is double that of women, and we've seen during the study that that um, divergence increases over time. TB co-infection greatly increases likelihood of mortality. So therefore, um, there's an urgency to improve interventions that focus on access and retention to men. There are a few interventions that we have seen being successful, and we have to consider um, whether we can scale them. These include after-hours clinics, male clinics and male adolescent-friendly services, and home-based self-testing and linkage to care. We should also consider looking at advanced HIV dis, uh, disease risk protocols. Next. I want to thank the data captures and health workers, the Western Cape Provincial Health Data Center, um, the team at UCT that oversees the TR software and open IHP staff, as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for supporting this study. Thank you. Thank you very much to Tawanda, Ruan, Cassidy, Sue, and Meg for their presentations on behalf of their co-authors from their new manuscripts in the JICE supplement, Men in HIV. My name is Dr. Anna Grimsrud and as one of the guest editors on this supplement, I'm really excited to briefly share some thoughts and reflections. These can be found in the supplement's editorial, shifting the narrative from the missing men to we are missing the men. I'm gonna describe the key themes and takeaways and given that we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, touch briefly on how COVID is further bringing into focus the state of men's health globally. The first key theme is the need for men to be recognized and engaged by health systems. In many resource limited settings, health systems are largely designed to, to address critical maternal and child health needs. The health services are further exacerbated by the reality that in many HIV prevalence countries or countries with high HIV prevalence, women are the majority of the health workforce. Men are therefore absent from the health system, both as patients and as providers. Engagement and involvement of men by health systems, primarily as a group that is interested in their own health, is a reasonable first step in addressing these glaring gaps. Secondly, we need HIV services also for our men who are over the age of 35. Historically, when there have been HIV interventions focusing on men, these have really been done to ensure services for their partners. And so when we look at the HIV population pyramid, we see that it is in men over 35 where there's the largest gaps in terms of who needs care. So we must make sure that interventions to reach these men are available and that we don't just focus on those younger than 35 years of age. Third, given that men are less likely to know their HIV status than women, HIV testing needs to be reconsidered. We've seen with the advent of HIV self-testing an accelerated interest in the modalities to reach men. And this is really exciting. We need to be sure that we are both A, reaching those who do not know their status, as well as B, using testing as a re-entry for men who are not currently engaged in care. In short, we need to reach those who are not currently being reached. The final theme is of critical importance, and this is all around reframing the narrative. It's time to shift away from a narrative that looks at men from a safe distance, blames men for poor health seeking behavior, behavior, and focuses on men solely to improve the health of their partners and children. Men need and are willing and deserve to have access to services for their own health. Our three key takeaways, both from the papers published here and the abstracts we've received, is that in addition to the critical importance of shifting the narrative, HIV programs may be uniquely positioned to drive a larger men's health agenda. And looking at our second takeaway, we really need to acknowledge that the health system is not working for anyone. These rigid gender norms undermine the health and well being of all people, of girls and women, of boys and men, and of gender minorities. In relation to HIV, the system isn't working for men, they're not accessing and benefiting from ART in the same way as women. The system's not working for adolescent girls and young women where HIV incidence remains unjustifiably high. 
and the HIV system isn't working for key populations among whom outcomes remain disturbingly poor. Data from COVID-19 further emphasizes the gendered nature of a pandemic, where on one hand, on the left-hand side here, you can see that the majority of countries are reporting the greatest number of deaths due to COVID among men, possibly driven by higher prevalence of underlying comorbidities, while at the same time on the right, the number of women infected is often larger than the number of men, given their role as frontline healthcare providers. And women may also be experiencing higher than usual levels of domestic violence during lockdown. But what's clear is that we do not want this false dichotomy. We don't want to pin men get against women. And so we need men's health policies that are really grounded within a gender equality framework. And so this is our call to action. As given that we are missing the men, it is our collective responsibility to ensure health systems that are people-centered, addressing the needs of all people, including men. Great. Um, so um, I hope you all enjoyed um, those presentations. We would like to ask that um, if you do have any questions or comments, please use uh, the chat box that you'll find at the top right-hand corner. Um, and uh, we, we will be asking our panelists to um, stick to just a few minutes in terms of responding to the questions so we can get through as many as possible. Um, um, and now maybe I can turn to James um, because I think you, you have some questions um, already for our panelists. Thank you. We now move on to the panel discussion with our special guest for this session. Um, so we all look up to WHO for guidance. A question for you, Wale. What will forthcoming WHO guidelines and strategic guidance recommend regarding men and HIV? Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, James. And I think um, it's very exciting to um, finally you know, see that we're getting to talk about men. Um, in responding to your question, I think it's important to not just look at what the guidelines say, but also the strategic thinking behind the work that WHO will be doing um, regarding men. So we will be working on men across the life course, um, certainly across programs, but also um, across the HIV cascade, which is where um, your question uh, brought us on. And if I can just go quickly through the cascade. Um, on prevention, for instance, um, we know um, the impact of BMMC um, as an example of enhancing uptake for, for men. And we are currently working on the VMMC um, guidelines. So that's the Voluntary Medical Male Circumcision Guidelines, uh, which will have a focus, a core focus on adolescent boys and, uh, and men. And it will have as well interventions, uh, evidence-based interventions and case studies uh, on what works across countries and across um, settings. Um, on testing, you would have seen our recently uh, developed uh, HIV testing guidelines which was released um, just last year. Um, the HIV testing team now have um, a men HIV testing technical working group, which will work on the strategic focus of how men can be engaged in testing. Uh, there is ongoing work now on workplace testing, uh, but also platforms for uh, engaging men, including faith-based uh, platforms. And I'm sure you've seen some of that in the, in the supplement. On treatment, um, it's not so much about the treatment, but about how um, uh, you know, men access the treatment. And we've seen the couple of experience on differentiated ART services for, for men across the cascade. And then finally, um, I talked in my introduction about engaging men in their diversity. Um, in, H in WHO, we have um, an active um, key populations, uh, an HIV team that are working on uh, upcoming guidelines for men who have sex with men, um, people who inject drugs, uh, but also people in closed settings like prisons, which we know majority of them are men. So quite a lot of work going on across the cascade um, at WHO. Thanks, Wale. Uh, Katie, over to you. How will what you've seen in the supplement and heard from countries impact uh, PEFA programming going forward? Well, I have to say that um, I, I I was very interested in, in the last um, presentation that we just saw um, with showing that um, men uh, presenting with a greater proportion of advanced disease and um, 
and and that uh, a greater proportion of uh, tuberculosis. Um, this fits nicely in with um, the in the advanced disease initiative um, that PEPFAR is proposing, and I think um, really um, the diagnostics and other um, activities that, um, that that are important for people with uh, advanced disease, and and if we expect that men are um, are presenting more frequently with advanced disease, I think that that's a, there's there's a clear intervention that may improve mortality. Um, I will say something about though, uh, maybe not to contradict, but to maybe add to the discussion Anna's discussion. I do believe that there's a, a biological um, biological reason for the um, uh, the sex differences in both COVID nineteen and for tuberculosis. We, men are definitely more susceptible to um, to TB and have. Uh, more cavitary disease, for example, and um, and and really um, and and poorer outcomes with TB. Um, there's some suggestion that this is also true for cryptococcal disease as well. So I think that um, I think that understanding and recognizing those biological differences that impact in in sort of that intersectional way with um, with the social determinants is is really critical. Uh, to provide um, to provide the appropriate and uh, needed medical care to all people with HIV, but particularly this this population that, that we're not reaching well. Thank you. Over. Thanks, Katie. Um, so, science uh, policymakers and programs are putting their best foot forward to advance better outcomes in men. So, for you, Nelson, I'd, I'd be curious to know what do you consider um, the important gaps regarding HIV in men, and what do we need to learn from our mistakes? Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for having me here. With regard to your question, I get it that uh, scientists, uh, policymakers, and everybody else is trying right now to get men on board, and I think they're just starting to, to try at the, at the moment because I see a few efforts with the men who have sex with men, but I see very limited uh, efforts that uh, target men who are in heterosexual relationship, actually who are the majority and who probably are causing the burden that we describe as a feminist burden. I call it a feminist burden because that is what informs the policy uh, because the program for that woman who is very vulnerable. And then that comes also with the blame that the men may be a male mobile vector of transmission. And that is the blame that I think uh, somebody has uh, mentioned here. But the other point really is that there is no average man. That's the mistake that we, we've made before because we thought we were going to program for an average man or a typical man and then all men will fall in. But I think last bit has been explained here, this require individualized approach and individualized care. And we can learn for differentiated uh, service del delivery models, whether community or clinical. We need to look at HIV as a long-term medical chronic condition that if we individualized care, then we are going to reach men more. And we also have a lesson, another lesson to learn that if we go for integrated services, for example, if we expand our TB programs or health programs, and even put incentives like uh, what we've learned here and economy, e economies and livelihood, men are more likely to come up. And uh, the other point is that we are more on the facility and the clinic. I think we need a mix of both uh, community, driven models and also uh, clinic uh, strength and linkage with clinics. And uh, in the clinics, I think what do I think we need to bring forward is that flexibility in terms of even time and even in terms of human resource and, and so on and so forth. So thank you very much for having me here. I'm happy to discuss this going forward, but uh, those are my insights for the time being. Oh, thank you. Um, so there's the role of behavior and behavior change. Uh, in this. So, Hasha, for you, what are the behavioral economics? What can behavioral economics, sorry, add to how we reach men with HIV and, and other uh, health services? Thank you, James. So, in taking stock of uh, the uh, several papers in, in the special issue, uh, there's three, three important points that stood out to me. Um, and, and one has to do with uh, incentives, of course, um, as, as the study by Dr. Barnabas showed, um, I, I think there's now 
reasonably good evidence that incentives are particularly effective for these one-time behaviors where you need somebody to initiate treatment or link to care. Um, and, and I think the issue now is really one about scale and how do you make the case to policymakers that if you're willing to spend X amount of dollars on treatment or PrEP, uh, that it's worth spending uh, a, a, a small fraction of it uh, on, on these one-time behaviors. Another behavioral economics principle that I think programs are using, and we see in the special issue, but I think we could do a lot more, is just making services more easy to use, more convenient to use. Uh, and a good example of that comes in the form of HIV self-testing. I think it's not a surprise that we see high demand uh, among men for services uh, or technologies of this type. So thinking about ways to make services more convenient and accessible uh, would, would make a difference. Um, a third observation has to do with the importance of social norms. Uh, again, and several papers point to the themes, uh, the theme of social norms. And, and I think when we look at male-friendly clinics and male-friendly services, that's one reason why we see them overcoming existing gaps is that they are uh, accommodating or allowing for a, a social norm that uh, persists in many countries, including the US for that matter about who who uses what types of health services. So those are three observations that from behavioral economics that I see reflected in work that's already happening. Just uh, th three additional points I wanna make about the way forward. Um, as, as the study uh, from South Africa and Lottery Incentive shows, um, behavior change for repeated behaviors has proven to be much more difficult uh, to change. And I think there we have a lot more work to do um, and I think we need to make more use of technologies. Uh, so simply offering a reward at the end of six months for being virally suppressed has, has generally not been very success effective, uh, but using technologies like real-time adherence monitors and, and, and to give uh, uh, regular feedback to patients, um, uh, even if it means reinforcing with some rewards could, could be useful. As we're seeing in the conference, um, uh, technologies like injectable ART or PrEP can also make a huge difference. Um, second point about other work in behavioral economics is we don't have to be thinking only about financial incentives first and foremost. Um, there's a whole other world of behavioral interventions, very low cost uh, that fall under the broad umbrella term of nudges that I think programs could be using more of. So default settings in terms of how services are delivered or framing of messages that they're using uh, with patients. Um, and and in that, on that point, I uh, just want to emphasize that in, in South Africa, um, my colleagues and I, several of us, are, are leading an effort to, uh, to, to help programs uh, develop more of these types of nudges as they try to reach men. Um, and then finally, the point I want to conclude with is that when we think about behavioral economics and what it has to offer for um, the, the challenge of reaching men, um, uh, I think it's important for us to also be trying to go upstream. So not only trying to figure out ways to engage men in health services, but also when we think about upstream behaviors, whether it's uh, risky sexual behavior or it's alcohol use. Um, those are areas where I think behavioral economics can help us understand the psychology of decision-making and poverty that results in these types of risk-taking behaviors. So there's an emerging area of work that is investigating how anti-poverty interventions, um, including the types of basic income and cash transfer grants we're seeing, can make a difference in people's lives uh, when it comes to their behavior. I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks, Hasha. Just a quick follow-up uh, question to you, Hasha, on the feasibility and sustainability of lottery incentives. Would, would you just give us a quick, uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think, um, happy to, I, I think the the short answer here would be that it, it's, a, it's a very valid question to think about broader implications of introducing incentives in programs. Um, I think from a uh, uh, from a purely uh, cost effectiveness resource allocation standpoint um, for certain behaviors like uh, take up of uh, one time take up of services, um, there's a really compelling rationale and it is uh, in sometimes it is frustrating to see um, 
uh, an aversion to, to taking on such interventions because they, they turn out to be very cost effective. And I suspect the lottery rewards uh, implemented in, 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 in South Africa and in the study we just heard about would, would fall into that category of being highly cost effective. Um, but then when we, when we talk about more repeated uh, use of incentives, I think that's where there are some challenging questions we have to face about whether there are alternative low cost or lower cost approaches to achieve the same behavior change. So if we're talking about adherence, which has been a, a thorny problem to, to solve in many settings, including the US when it comes to chronic disease uh, medications, um, it may well be that for certain segments of the population, we need to be considering slightly higher cost interventions uh, to promote uh, adherence. Great, um, Harsha, thank you very much. And, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, it's been really um, interesting to hear your points of view on um, the supplement. Unfortunately, we are at the end of our session um, and we see a lot more comments and, and questions coming in. And so we, we look forward to future sessions where, where we are able to discuss the issue of men and, and clearly, you know, we, we're delighted to see that um, there are more conversations happening about um, how to include men um, and including um, the emerging issue around COVID. Um, but there are challenges. And, and as was noted by somebody um, that the UNAIDS uh, released their, their report um, this week and what we see on the cover page are only photos of women. And so we're missing the men. Um, and so just, just wanted to end with that. So thank you to all of our, um, uh, all of our presenters uh, and all of the authors in the supplement as well, as well as to my guest editors. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye and thank you.